In 2277, a small community in the ruins of Arlington, Virginia, came under attack by waves of monstrously large fire-breathing ants. I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is the story of Grey Ditch. We'll start this with an examination of the sites surrounding Grey Ditch in the Fallout universe. We'll then move on to the layout and composition of the town, and follow that with a known history of Grey Ditch. We'll then close with some notes that I have on the topic. With that said, let's get started. While Grey Ditch is a community that came into being in the post-war world, it's housed within pre-war structures. These structures lie just to the west of Arlington National Cemetery, an area that in the real world lies within Arlington, Virginia. The dramatically different natures of these neighborhoods between the in-game and real-world locations means that this is about as close a tie as we can make. That said, let's look at the community and its surroundings. Greenwich lies west of the downtown DC ruins and the southern central section of the version of the Capital Wasteland that we get to explore in Fallout 3. Megaton lies in the hills to the northwest. Closer to Greyditch, but in the same direction, lies the Sewer Way Station. North-northwest of Greyditch lies the raider-infested Super Duper Mart. Northeast of Greyditch, at Wilhelm's Wharf, Grandma Sparkle works as a trader and cook. The Anchorage War Memorial, found on an island in the Potomac, northeast of Greyditch, has become a haven for mire lurks. East of Greyditch, across the river, lies an old hotel known as Dukov's Place, and the mole-rat-infested Tepid Sewers. Southeast of Greyditch lies the Arlington National Cemetery, and the nearby Chinese intelligence base at Mama Dolce's. With the surroundings of Greyditch covered, let's consider the community itself. By 2277, there were three homes occupied in Greyditch. That of the Wilkes family, that of the Brandis family, and that of Dr. Lesko. Along with this, while most of the remaining homes were boarded up, there were two available but abandoned homes in Greyditch at the time. Besides the houses, there was a Dots Diner, a Pulowski Preservation Shelter, and at the south end of the community, the Marigold Station of the DC Metro. With that said, let's get into the story of Greyditch in the Fallout universe. Much of the history of the area in which Greyditch now lies has been lost to time, but we can assume that the people who lived here were of relatively good means, and likely worked in the service sector, whether public or private. That said, in the aftermath of the bombs, it's likely the case that the neighborhood was abandoned like most of the DC area. Eventually, the area evolved into a transient community, which was occupied by wastelanders for short periods of time before they moved on to greener pastures. Due to its proximity to downtown DC, the area wasn't a common target for most raider bands, but this by no means meant that it was safe. The raiders avoided this area because of the massive population of feral ghouls and monsters that occupied the ruins of the city and its metro system. Those who lived in Grey Ditch found themselves occasionally beset by giant ants, although the exact source of these creatures wasn't plain to see. By the fall of 2276, the only occupants of Grey Ditch were the Wilkes family, composed of Fred Wilkes and his son Brian. In late September to early October 2276, the Brandeis family moved in across the street. William Brandeis, once a soldier of the Enclave forces at Navarro, California, had deserted his comrades and fled across the country with his wife Sheila and their son Will. They came all the way to DC, seeking a place where they could avoid entanglements with his former employer. It was therefore fairly dismaying for Mr. Brandeis that, upon finding a working radio, he heard patriotic tunes and friendly speeches from the voice of a man identifying himself as President John Henry Eden. They hadn't in fact managed to leave all the Enclave behind. He became paranoid after this, fearing any new face in the community was potentially that of an agent of the Enclave. While William Brandeis was too defensive to be welcoming, his wife Sheila was happy to invite the Wilkes over. Despite his fear of outsiders, William was happy to see that his son Will got along well with Brian Wilkes. Though he was about a year older than Brian, Will shared his comic collection with him, and the two of them explored the limits of Greyditch, seeking its every secret. In November 2276, there was another new face in town, that of a scientist known as Dr. Lesko. He moved in with the Wilkes family while Mr. Wilkes helped him to build his own shack. Though Dr. Lesko offered to pay Mr. Brandeis to help with the construction too, he turned him down. William wasn't comfortable with the situation, and he watched the doctor closely for any sign of an attachment to the Enclave. Though Dr. Lesko wasn't a part of the Enclave, he undoubtedly came to Greyditch with ulterior motives. He was here for the ants. When his shack was complete, Dr. Lesko moved in and began work on a new experiment. Whether or not this was an intended result, it seems that by late February 2277, the number of giant ants in town was swelling. William Brandeis, worried about his family's safety from this rising threat, traveled to Megaton and purchased a gun for his family's protection. He taught his wife and son how to use the gun and hid it behind the fridge to keep it safe until they needed it. By April of 2277, Dr. Lesko's work on the ants was having definite results. 
While William Brandeis was out scavenging, he witnessed one of the ants light a fire. When the family had arrived in Greyditch, Mr. Brandeis had buried his old Enclave sidearm, a laser pistol, to keep it nearby but also out of sight of any agents investigating him. After seeing his first fire ant, he decided it was time to dig that gun up. Over the next two months, things only got worse in Greyditch as the fire ants increased in number and began to overwhelm the community. On June 17th, the Brandeis family was cut off from the Wilkes family, with fire ants having taken over the streets. After having managed to cross the continent in the post-apocalypse, the Brandeis family didn't survive this. Though we don't know exactly how it got there, the body of William Brandeis can be found in the depths of Marigold Station, while the remains of Sheila and Will are nowhere to be found. Though we don't know exactly when it happened, the ants managed to break into the Wilkes house and kill Fred Wilkes. Thanks to his thorough exploration of the neighborhood, Brian Wilkes managed to get away and hide from the ants and survive on his own. In late August 2277, Brian spied a figure in a blue and yellow jumpsuit walking by Greyditch and ran out to cry for aid. Brian pleaded with a lone wanderer of Vault 101 to kill the monsters that had taken control of Greyditch and to find his father. Having recently left the vault on a hunt for their own absent father, the lone wanderer was only happy to help the young man. Brian, happy to just be able to talk to another human being after being alone for so long, recounted what he could about his home. After this, the lone wanderer descended into the town. While the search for Mr. Wilkes commenced, Brian hid himself in the local Pulaski Preservation Shelter, where he was heard quoting a movie he never could have seen. In the ruined Wilkes house, the lone wanderer found the body of Fred Wilkes. Thanks to his time helping Dr. Lesko build his shack, Brian's father had a spare key to the front door. The Lone Wanderer let themselves into Dr. Lesko's home and found it abandoned. In investigating the doctor's terminal, they learned about the doctor and his actions over the past few months. It seems that after setting up in his shack that he had been working on a mutagen to reduce the ants' size back to their pre-war levels. He had found their nest in Marigold Station and sent his Protectron inside to apply the mutagen. It was also clear that he was aware of his failures, but from the ants outside, it seems that he hadn't managed to correct his mistakes before disappearing. Battling through the fire-breathing ants, the Lone Wanderer managed to push into Marigold Station and descend into its depths. Here they happened upon another of Dr. Lesko's labs and were surprised to discover that he was still alive. Dr. Lesko explained the nature of the experiment, injecting ant eggs to reduce the size of the adults successively more generation by generation. Just beyond his lab lay the nest in which the giant ant queen laid the eggs in question. Unfortunately, he had been unable to correct his mistakes as he had lost access to the hatchery chamber. Five nest guardians barred the way. He asked the lone wanderer to deal with those nest guardians, and they agreed so as to stop the flow of fire ants. When confronted about the deaths he caused, Lesko put it off as a small price to pay for a future without giant ants. Despite his callous attitude, the lone wanderer descended into the ant nest at the behest of the doctor. When the guardians were slain, Lesko could finally re-enter the nest and resume his experiments. Beyond this, he could fire off a pulse that broke the empathic link between the queen and her drones, which caused those remaining ants to kill each other. The Lone Wanderer had suggested simply killing the queen, but Dr. Lesko had begged them not to. Months of hard work would be lost. And thanks for having saved his experiment, the doctor offered to inject the Lone Wanderer with one of two special mutagenic serums. Well, both of these serums would make the Lone Wanderer 25% more resistant to fire damage, one would improve their strength, while the other would improve their perception. Dr. Lesko also asked the Lone Wanderer to help Brian Wilkes to find a new home, not out of some level of worry for the youth, but to prevent him from bothering him in the future. With their business concluded, the Lone Wanderer returned to Brian Wilkes in his shelter. Though he was happy that the ants were no longer a problem, Brian was gloomy about his future, living alone in Greyditch. Wanting to ensure the youth's safety, the Lone Wanderer asked Brian if he had any living relatives, and luckily he did. It turns out that his cousin Vera Weatherly operated the Weatherly Hotel in Rivet City. Upon explaining Brian's circumstances to Vera, she told him that she would be happy to take him in. When the Lone Wanderer returned to Greyditch, he found that Brian had buried his father and cleared the dead ants out of his home. When told that he was welcome to live with Vera, he was thrilled and left for Rivet City shortly thereafter. When visited there by the Lone Wanderer, he told them how happy he was, how Vera genuinely cared for him, and how he had made new friends. In visiting Dr. Lesko after this, he can be found hard at work on a new strain within his shack in Greyditch. Despite the pulse that is supposed to have caused all the fire ants to kill each other, it seems that some were out of its range as they have begun to reappear within Marigold Station. Dr. Lesko is quick to explain that these are simply remnants of the original batch and not something new. If the Lone Wanderer feels like gathering the nectar from these fire ants, the Doctor will buy it off them for use in the next mutagen. That about does it for the narrative of Great Itch, but I've got some notes on the topic before closing things out. 
First, the giant fire ants of Great Itch seem like the perfect jumping off point to talk about the giant arthropods of the Fallout universe. From ants to scorpions, to flies, to cockroaches and more, the Fallout universe is home to a lot of enormous arthropods. While the large size of these bugs is attributed to radiation from the Great War, that doesn't really serve as a full explanation for their prosperity in the post-war world. There's a reason we don't have bugs like this in the real world. Well, at least not anymore. Earth was once home to many large arthropods, including the 8 foot long Arthropleura millipede, but it's been nearly 300 million years since these monstrous creatures last scuttled around. For about 60 million years, a time known in geological terms as the Carboniferous period, the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere is thought to have been between 35 and 40 percent, basically double today's concentration of 21 percent. This is relevant to this point as most terrestrial arthropods breathe through their exoskeleton. There's a ratio of surface area to volume that is supportable based on the concentration of atmospheric oxygen, and that controls the size of these bugs. The larger they get, both surface area and volume increase, but volume increases faster. Too high a volume to too low a surface area and the bugs can't breathe enough to survive. Getting back to the Fallout universe, we must ask how these enormous bugs can survive given their large size. There are at least two logical options. A, the oxygen concentration in the Earth's atmosphere has dramatically increased since the Great War. Or B, the arthropods have mutated new metabolic processes that allow them to survive at an increased size without the normally requisite atmospheric oxygen concentration. It could well be the case that oxygen is more abundant. There are fewer beings respiring and turning some of that oxygen into carbon dioxide. But there are also fewer plants photosynthesizing as well. B is the more interesting option, as it would even potentially mean that the increased size of the arthropods is in itself the mutation, but a response to the mutation. They're bigger because they can be, not because the radiation made them bigger. While this is hard to explain across multiple species, I think that it's the more interesting of the two options I've posed. Second, we've seen a mutation like pyrosis before in the Fallout universe. Well, technically it's a mutation that we've seen chronologically before, but in a game released 10 years later. In Fallout 76's Vault 96, vault Tech was testing mutation serums on a wide host of test specimens. On January 12, 2080, they created the pyrogenesis mutation, and with it, firewolves. While the initial experiment caused the wolf to simply burst into flames, they managed to create a proper firewolf five days later. Though it should be noted that on death it still exploded in flames. I want to be clear here that this is not the same mutation, and the mechanics of their functioning are completely different. Dr. Lesko's fire ants developed two mutations, a vibrating venom gland and an alteration to their mandibles that he called a calefaction array. The oscillations in the venom gland were fast enough to create severe volatility in the ants' venom while the high heat of their mandibles would then ignite the venom when excreted. It should be noted that this is a strange mutation for a quite simple reason. Real ants don't bite, they sting. While that might seem strange considering that we call them ant bites, the truth of the matter is that ant venom glands are in their abdomen. Yes, ants have mandibles that they use to bite and hold things, but the raised bumps that people associate with ants are in fact ant stings. With that said on pyrosis, I have no idea how the pyrogenesis mutation works. On the topic of Vault 96, it's a fascinating vault. I highly recommend checking out my two videos on the topic, specifically what happened to Vault 96 and Blackburn. Third, I have found myself considering Dr. Lesko's title of doctor. While there are a few organizations out there, such as the Institute, with the legitimate authority to grant the title of doctor, there are many docs and doctors in the wasteland that likely granted themselves their titles. Fourth, Dr. Lesko's terminal password, Formicidae, is the biological family classification in which ants lie. Fifth, there's a typo in William Brandeis's terminal entries in which he refers to his son Will as Frank. For a little while I thought that Frank was another character living in Greyditch, the elder son of William and Sheila. Brian Wilkes refers to the community's population as being seven, and that seventh individual is not accounted for. I even thought maybe he only wanted to teach his elder son Frank how to shoot, but there's one line that breaks this concept for me. Quote, I'm going to have to find a better way to protect Sheila and Will from those ants. Unquote. I can't imagine that he wouldn't mention trying to protect Frank just as he would his wife and Will. I think if Frank was another son of his, the line would have been something like, I'm going to have to find a better way to protect Sheila and the boys from those ants. I didn't bother to bring up this unnamed seventh resident of Greatage during the narrative because the only evidence that they ever existed is Brian's claim that there were seven residents. We know literally nothing else about them. There's also a strange story related to this typo terminal entry. He bought the gun for home protection and went through the trouble of training his wife and son on its proper usage, but he also didn't let them know where the gun was. 
In this terminal entry, he tells them that if he's not there and they need the gun, it's behind the fridge. Why wouldn't his wife know where that was? I, I can see him not letting his son know to prevent him from using it outside of parental supervision, but why wouldn't William have told Sheila where the gun was? I'm hoping that this was a temporary state of things, as in the next terminal entry it's made clear that he has dug up his old Enclave sidearm and is carrying it with him all the time. Seventh, living in Rivet City is one of the possible outcomes for Brian Wilkes. The least effort involves simply leaving him in Grey Ditch to fend for himself. The Lone Wanderer can convince Mayor McCready to allow Brian to live with the other orphans in Little Lamplight, where he lives a better experience than being alone, but not as good of one as living with Vera. Lastly, if the Lone Wanderer is a real sack of crap, they can sell Brian to Eulogy Jones at Paradise Falls. I didn't even bother to film this version because I can't bring myself to do something that evil. Eighth, Vera is either Brian's aunt or cousin. Brian says that she's his cousin, while the Lone Wanderer can tell Vera that her nephew needs a place to live. I'm not sure which of these is correct. Ninth, Dr. Lesko has the textbook ends justifying the means mindset that we see in so many scientists in the Fallout universe. He even goes so far as to say, quote, If that means the loss of a few lives to save generations of lives in the future, it's a small price to pay, unquote. That line is so despicable, especially when you consider that he's not the one paying the price. The innocent people of Greyditch were. His mindset and careless actions remind me a lot of Dr. Edgar Blackburn. Tenth, there's a dumpster with loot in it behind the Dots Diner. The contents of this locked container were put there by Mr. Wilkes, and Brian has the key to it. The Lone Wanderer, if skilled enough in speech or in the skill of saving and loading repeatedly, can convince Brian to give them this key, or potentially pick the lock if they have a lock-picking skill of 100. Lastly, my hope with this story is that Sheila and Will Brandeis escaped the events of 2277. While it's possible to say that they were food for the Queen, we can always hope that their remains aren't present in Greyditch because they escaped. I'd like to think that Mr. Brandeis sacrificed himself for his family, throwing himself into combat with the Fire Ants, drawing them away so that his wife and son could escape. The only reason they didn't take Brian Wilkes with them is because they didn't know that he'd survived the Fire Ant assault on the Wilkes house. Alright, I think that'll do it for the story of what happened to Greyditch. Follow me on Twitter for lore video announcements at Gaming with Maps. My Discord is open to the public, there's a link in the channel's banner. If you're interested in discussing Fallout lore, want announcements on upcoming content, or would like to vote on the next lore video or make requests, come on by. I've started streaming every Friday evening on YouTube, come check it out if you're interested. If you appreciate what I do here, and you want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron with Patreon. I want to thank my patrons Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, Dark Malcontent, Real76, Dr. Orion, Samsung Smart Fridge, Knight Spearhead, and Ahotep for their support. This has been the Irresolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.